You're listening to Veg Your Best. There has never been a more important time to be vegan. My name's Michelle Olander. I'm a life coach and I want to show you here on Veg Your Best that living vegan is actually the superpower that's going to unlock your possibilities and give you the confidence to take on your next impossible goal by doing it your way. If I could go vegan in my 50s with all my excuses, I know you can start moving in that direction too. Veg your best and there's nothing you can't do. Episode 124, The Joyful Vegan, Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Welcome. Welcome and welcome back to Veg Your Best. I think we've all got a treat this week. I know I do. Our guest, our guest this week is someone I was kind of afraid to invite. Colleen Patrick Goudreau, aka The Joyful Vegan. Colleen has been a fixture in the vegan online and podcasting space and she does it all. She creates recipes and classes. She plans vegan adventures and travel. She writes books, makes videos, and Colleen's podcast, Food for Thought, has just celebrated 17 years. 17 years of podcasting. Did you even know that there were podcasts 17 years ago? You know, I meet people all the time who have no idea what a podcast is still. And Colleen was doing this 17 years ago. Now, I was afraid to invite Colleen because it seemed the height of cheek to reach out to her. But Colleen was so gracious. And I think, I think that if you're new to Colleen's work, you'll love getting to know her. And if you are already a fan, you're going to enjoy this conversation too. So let's not delay another minute. And of course, of course, the contact details for Colleen Patrick Goudreau will be in the show notes. So for now, just listen. Colleen Patrick Goudreau, welcome to Veg Your Best podcast. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's a pleasure. I've been following you for a long time, and I actually didn't even realize how long a time it's been. So I want to introduce you to my listeners and some of the people that I work with who are a little bit newer to veganism and plant-based lifestyles and the um, the different ethical and environmental aspects that you've been dealing with for a really, really long time. And I'd love to hear your synopsis version of um, what brought you to veganism. Mm -hmm. Well, that's okay. That's, there's a couple questions there. So um, thank you. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, really nice to connect with you. And yeah, I mean, I think it's, I think it's great that there are people who do not know my work. I would not be doing a very good job if I had only the same people listening to me <laughs> again and again for all these years. So it's good. And it also means that there are a lot more people coming into this space. And that's super encouraging to me, especially having been in the space for a very long time. So I have been vegan for 24 years. This is my 24th year. And prior to that, I was an animal advocate even before I was vegan. Yes. You can be an animal advocate, even if you're not vegan. And I say that because I think there's a lot of misconceptions and there can be some rigidity around what it means to be vegan and what it means to be compassionate. And compassion has always been the foundation of my work. It's why I started doing the work I do, uh, again, even before I was vegan, because I was a compassionate person when I wasn't vegan. I was vegetarian, I was pescatarian, and I had my own journey that I think so many people can identify with. And again, I emphasize that you can be compassionate, and not be vegan, because because I was a compassionate person, I just wasn't living in the full the fullness of my compassion. And it was compartmentalized and it was conditional. And that's one of the things that I love so much about being vegan is that it is the full manifestation of the things I care about effortlessly, effortlessly. And I say effortlessly, very aware of the fact that making a change is difficult for people. And becoming vegan can be difficult for people because change is hard and we tend to resist change. And so effortless in the sense that once you have a shift in 
consciousness, once you have a shift in behavior, it is effortless. But prior to that, the transition itself can be really difficult. So, so I count myself uh, among those who guide people to th through that transition. And that's one of the things I think that's made my work unique is we need to talk about why vegan. We need to talk about why it really matches so many of the things we care about, whether it's related to wellness and health and the environment and animals and ethics. Um, but I really think people struggle with the how. I think people know the why. I think that's why people say, don't tell me, I don't want to know because <laughs> they know and they don't want the details in their heads because they know that if they really know, they're going to be compelled to make a change. And that's where I come in. Like, I don't care how you got here. I just want to help you through it. And I want to help you do it joyfully and sustainably and deliciously. So I'm kind of answering a bunch of your questions at once. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at now and how I started doing this work and why I do the work I do, because going backward, I, you know, I was like everybody else. I grew up eating animals and I grew up loving animals and I didn't see the connection. And I was a kid who was a very typical kid. I ate everything. I think there's a real notion that, you know, once you're vegan, like you've always been vegan, <laughs> like you're some ethereal, magical being and like, oh my God, I can't identify with you. No, I was not vegan. And I ate everything that walked or swam or flew. And I had parents who supported me in my compassion for animals, but they fed me everything they had been fed because that's all they knew. And so that was my childhood, but I was a child who loved animals don't think you have to have loved animals to not want to hurt them. But I was one of those children who really, truly connected with animals and still do and loved being around them and would never have hurt them directly. And so when I kind of made the connection, really made the connection when I was about 19. So, you know, I'll count that as kind of old, older, right? I mean, probably knew some things when I was younger than that, but it was when I was 19 or 20 that I picked up John Robbins book, Diet for New America. And it was the first time I had really seen the images, first time I had really understood the confinement and the industrialized aspect of it. And I missed some things because I basically was convinced and I stopped eating land animals, but I continued eating dairy and I continued eating eggs. And the thing that's ironic, it's just kind of a fun part of the story is my father had owned different ice cream stores. And John Robbins, of course, was the, you know, was the beneficiary of the Baskin Robbins empire. Yeah. yeah empire exactly and and so it was kind of fitting they was just kind of interesting that that's you know that i mean i certainly i certainly was not the beneficiary of an empire my father just owned some franchise individual stores but the point is that was kind of my background as well but i missed the part about dairy and so i kept eating dairy and uh and probably fish at the time and and eggs and so it took a few more years before i continued reading books and learning and i read a I do read happy books, but I read a book called Slaughterhouse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an investigative journalist named Gail Eisnitz who went into slaughterhouses based on a whistleblower who was a, who was a, um, an inspector uh, for the USDA and identified the fact that, of course, you know, the the uh, the law was not being adhered to. And so it was a whistleblower. And so Gail Eisnitz got involved and she didn't want people to read a book about one slaughterhouse and think it was one bad apple and never really make the connection. So she basically went around to slaughterhouses around the country and asked the same questions to the slaughterhouse workers. And it was an incredibly painful read. I'm not going to lie, but it was exactly what I needed. And it was the book that just really woke me up, you know, so John Robbins book was kind of the beginning of that of that journey. And then Slaughterhouse was really just the thing that absolutely opened my eyes. And I became vegan at that moment. And I became what I, I characterize as becoming fully awake. I mean, cause I was still kind of sleeping when it came to some of the other issues. And I very quickly became an advocate. I mean, I was an advocate, as I said, but I quickly became a vegan advocate and, uh, and an activist around um, veganism and started doing outreach and tabling and leafleting and having, um, I would basically set up a TV and a VCR. If anybody knows what a VCR is still, I had a VCR and a TV on the streets of Berkeley and was showing slaughter videos and answering questions to passersby and really kind of holding people's emotions as they watched what I watched in horror 
and didn't want to be part of it, but didn't know how to go about making a change. And it was then that I really found my calling, which was pretty quick, which was, I, I want to be that guide. I want to be there for people's transition. And because it's all the same questions, which makes my life easier, makes my job easy when it's how do I eat? Where do I shop? What about family? What about holidays? What about protein? What about protein? What about protein? What about protein? Same questions over and over again. Classic right? vegan joke, right? <laughs> I mean, it is, but it's true. And it's true. And so I wanted to answer those questions and I wanted to give people resources and I wanted to empower them to make the change that they were compelled to make based on the information they were confronting. And that's what I did. And, you know, I have a background of a master's in English literature, did not have a master's in culinary arts, but I started teaching cooking classes right away after that and continued to use kind of my, my passions and my skills to do the work that I wanted to do, which was guide people to manifest their own values in their behavior. And that was back in 1999 when I started doing that. And I'm still doing it in different mediums. And I've always worked in all medium speaking podcast writing i'm a writer it's my it's my passion it's my background and that's in it in a nutshell and i've you know several books since then cookbooks but lifestyle books guidebooks to becoming vegan and uh, my podcast is in its 17th year this year that's like crazy. before anyone knew about podcasts right <laughs> before i knew about <laughs> podcasts i didn't even know what i was doing and and it's a real it's a real honor to be part of people's journeys it's a real honor as you know was Food for Thought, the name of your podcast, was that the original name of your podcast? Was that 17 years ago? Yeah. Good question. So the original name was Vegetarian Food for Thought, even though it was vegan. And even my cooking classes at the time, I called them vegetarian cooking classes. And this just goes to show how far we've come because the word vegan, even though I wasn't hiding from the word vegan, but I'm a proponent of meeting people where they're at. I'm not going to do something that's going to basically hinder people from coming to my work. I want them to come and then we can talk about what we have to talk about. So I also uh, believe in, you know, I, I the word vegetarian originally was an umbrella term that included not consuming dairy and eggs. So it kind of was the original vegan, right? So I was using it as an umbrella term. And then really as time was going by, I just felt like it didn't even need vegetarian or vegan. And so that got dropped. And so it's just food for thought now. It's not vegan food for thought. It's just food for thought um, because it really does come cover more than just what I think people narrowly think about when they think about vegetarianism or veganism. Um, it really is a mindset of, you know, a lens to look through the world with compassion and optimal wellness. I mean, that's really what it is. And that's pretty broad. And so I do cover topics more than just nutrition and food. It really is about sustainable mindset and sustainable living and um, environmentalism, as you talked about, conservation, wildlife, uh, so many different things. So yeah, the good question. It was uh, vegetarian food for thought, and now it's just food for thought. And recently, we we heard your favorite books and um, movies of the last year, and they aren't all, in fact, were any of them particularly uh, political or vegan or no? Uh, yeah, they seemed, I was thinking, I love um, <clears throat> the biography of Dr. Johnson. Okay, we can have a little geek out right now. <laughs> And um, and uh, your uh, your your bi biographies of the uh, of the uh, political figures was it Ron Chern Chernow's um, um, books? Yeah, and the presidents of yeah yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to to interrupt. I get very excited about just go ahead and film. Well, I just you know they're passions of mine, and you know I have an audience now who's interested in you know kind of what I'm you know I think all of us are interested in what our friends are listening to or, or reading and I have an audience so I can I can share this in a you know in a way that um that hopefully other people will be inspired in in a, in a larger way but I also one of the things that's always been part of my podcast and my work is has been literature and language and film and those are the three art forms and I'll include language in there uh that for me that resonate with me music as well and for me what's so exciting because because we are human beings who all grapple with the same questions and the same struggles and the same challenges. How do I live a meaningful life? How do I live in a way that is, you know, that's going to leave its mark? How do I live as compassionately and consciously as possible? I think we all ask these questions or, if, or whoever's listening to your podcast and my podcast, they're asking those questions. Right. And so I've always been a huge reader and a film goer and 
And those are the mediums that for me are really, really exciting. And so I've always talked about how artists, writers, filmmakers, musicians use their art to ask those questions especially as they relate to our relationship with other animals. And so I have talked, I've I've had many episodes in the podcast and it's a dream to do a book on it. Uh, not the language, that's a dream as well, but to do a book on film and animals in film. And I don't just mean vegan films and I don't mean, you know, conservation films. There are plenty of those. I mean, films by just your average filmmaker or books by your average, by your average writer or about, a more a, a, a larger than average person like Samuel Johnson. And, and there's an example in Samuel Johnson's biography and Boswell's biography of him. He talks about his relationship with his cat and he talks about his perspective of animals, right? Mm -hmm. So where do we find all these nooks and crannies of our relationship with other animals and how they play out in art? Because <laughs> That's one of the ways we understand the world is through is through art. So yeah, maybe there was there weren't specific films, and that wouldn't have been the episode for it from last year. And actually, there were though, um, or books. But I have talked on the podcast a lot about um, how artists use their art to answer these questions or ask these questions about how we treat other animals, how we see other animals, what we think of other animals, and so. Thanks for bringing that up and thanks for listening. I think um, one of my dreams is when you can identify as a vegan and people don't think that that is 100% of who you are, that you're not just an activist, that activism and the way you fuel yourself and the way you consume and the pr the things you buy, these are not, these are just normal or close to normal or close to typical. And they're, they're part of living a life on earth. They're part of living life. Um, and just as reading and raising your families and voting and, you know, all the other parts of being a human, a rounded human being in, in the world. So I actually love it when um, vegan, uh, vegan human beings have other things they'd like to share with us, because I think it, I think very often the world kind of wants to compartmentalize us a little bit, fringe us, other us. And um, so I love it. And you talked about um, words language, um, vegetarian versus vegan, that can sometimes be a fraught conversation with certain people. Um, I would love to know your take on plant-based because that's one that I found very awkward for the longest time. And now it's really taken off. And I wonder, I wonder what your thoughts are about that term. Yeah. You know, again, I kind of said it earlier. I, you know, I want to meet people where they're at. And actually you're, you're touching on a topic that's very similar when you were talking about being interested in other things, not compartmentalizing. And then we're talking about this, this term plant-based they're actually related. And I talk about this in the joyful vegan, my most recent book. And I talk about it in the context of identity. Mm. And it's so important because what happens is we can be othered, but we can also other ourselves and we can make our vegan identity so dominant that it, it, it's, you know, it submerges all the other identities we have, which I think is what ultimately then puts us at odds with the people in our lives. Now, I think it's a natural part of the process when you're kind of finding, you know, it's like autonomy, like when you're literally trying, like when a child is literally trying to find who they are in the world relative to their parents. Mm. I think that's part of what happens when you're forging your vegan identity. But if it winds up clouding all of your other relationships, I think that's the social, um, the social interactions that become problematic, I think that's where we're responsible. And we can't we can't let that one identity overwhelm all the other identities because first of all, it, for me, if veganism is just a manifestation of my compassion, and it is, <laughs> then it's not different than my other identities. It's it infuses all of my other identities as a as a mother, as a daughter, as a friend, as a writer, as a citizen, as right. That that's part of who we are. And I think veganism or we vegan, we can all be guilty of compartmentalizing that part of our identity to the degree that it appears to compete with all of our other ones. And I think, and so we have to be mindful of that. I can't control what other people do with the definition of veganism, but I can control how I define it and characterize it. And that's what worries me about some vegan advocacy that I see is that it, 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 it does make it seem like vegan 
is different from all the other things. And kind of monolithic, kind of like one way to do it, one kind of. mm. Yes. And so when we talk about plant-based, then if the word plant-based makes it more palatable for you to make a change that really is so anathema to so many aspects of our lives in that we're doing things that are against the status quo, because let's face it, the majority of people eat meat, dairy, and eggs. The majority of people wear leather. The, you know, I wouldn't say the majority of people these days go to animal acts. Thank goodness that's something that's falling away. But you know, the zoo is still very popular across the world. Uh, so those are things that are all part of the status quo. And we do come out looking a bit like, um, you know, very different from the status quo. And that can be very difficult, difficult um, without our doing anything either way. So if the word plant-based, if the term plant-based makes it easier for us, because as I said earlier, right, if it means people are going to be able to lean in to you rather than go, oh, I have these misconceptions and biases against the word vegan, I'm just out. Mm. then then great, use the word. So I don't have a problem with it. And I have talked about the fact that I tend to talk about food as plant-based because vegan for me is an orientation to the world. It's an orientation. It's, it's it, and, and you can call it an identity, but I'll actually mention that regarding plant-based as well. It's an orientation. For me, plant-based does refer to food. And I, I you know, like is, is a food vegan? Like that feels weird to me. Like it feels awkward to me because part of what I try to do is demystify food because it's just food. And when we call it vegan food, it makes it sound like it's a separate food group. And I think that turns people off as well. So I tend to use the word plant-based when I'm referring to a menu item or, you know, a product that we might look at the ingredients for the ingredients are plant-based versus calling them vegan. So it doesn't sound like it's so um, foreign because it's not Mm. vegan food. It's just food. But I'll say one last thing about plant-based. It's very interesting because one of the things I was doing in The Joyful Vegan was trying to identify why there's recidivism in veganism or plant-based living, why people go back to eating meat, dairy, and eggs. And one of the things that's very interesting is bringing back identity is, so again, it's always finding these gray areas because I'm about to say something that's going to sound like I'm contradicting myself, but I don't, but I don't think it is a contradiction, is One of the reasons you see, you tend to see more recidivism in people who choose plant-based, meaning choose becoming vegan for health reasons, is because one of the reasons is because they don't identify eating in a way that becomes part of their identity. It just becomes, it is something they do rather than something they are. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean you have to call yourself vegan, but it's the difference between saying I eat plant-based and I am plant-based. So if you can use plant-based as a way to say, that's an orientation to the world, it's, it's one of my identities, then that does seem to have a stronger grip on our consciousness than just saying it's something I do. Because if it's just something you do, you can change that anytime. But if it's something you are, if it's part of who you are and part of what you care about, part of your value system, then you tend to hold on to that more tenaciously than than you would if you didn't. Does that make sense? It, it totally does. And you're anticipating my, my podcast for next week. It is about identity and it is about how it is shifting behavior. It can be white knuckled and it can be forced and it can be willpowered, but to really become a little more effortless and a little more relaxed and enjoy, it's that identity that does shift. Mm-hmm. And um, and we can we can practice doing things that help ourselves make that shift in identity. So if we're always staying on that action line <clears throat> of behavior, not going into our thoughts and our feelings about why we're doing something. So this is a very, very wonderful topic for me to to hear hear your your point of view on. Because I found I I personally was surprised that plant-based took off. I thought it sounded so kind of hard to say <laughs> about mm-hmm. 10 years ago when I was first hearing it. I thought it was very awkward sounding. But I think a lot of people feel more comfort with it than they do with vegan because vegan seems to be like they're coming after you and somehow they're going to watch what you've got in your closet and check out what the um, interior of your car looks like. And maybe some people do behave that way, do judge that way. But I always think we want to be leaning in, as you say, leaning in to learning what can we do? How And you always say, is it always your tagline to even if you can't do everything, do something? That's right. Yeah, that's right. And that's the thing, too. It's really funny because I know that vegans hear this about the plant based vegan and they get very nervous because we have this black and white attitude about it. I am clearly embracing the word vegan my whole 
brand is joy, the joyful vegan. My books are the 30 day vegan challenge, the joyful vegan, the vegan table, color me vegan, vegan's daily companion. I don't shy away from it. My answer to your question was how do I feel about it in general? And if other people want to use it, that means it's resonating for them. And of course they should be coming from a very authentic, truthful place for them. For me, I'm coming from a very truthful, authentic place by saying vegan, because vegan means something very specific to me. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to be aware of other people's response to that word. Mm -hmm. So if we want to be advocates in the world, we have to be malleable and we have to be flexible and we have to be resilient and, and mindful. It's not about just having a hard line approach and it's always this, always all the time. It's a matter of kind of meeting people where they're at and, and contextualizing it and customizing kind of, you know, how, how I, how I talk to someone based on someone, you know, versus someone else. That's not being inauthentic. It's actually being quite authentic. And it is, uh, it, it's, it's going to be more effective because I'm, I'm customizing my response and my language and my framing of things based on who who is standing in front of me because there are a lot of different people in this world and they're not all going to respond to the same thing. Having said that, I am all about demystifying what it means to be vegan. I am all about trying to define veganism in a way that's that's very palatable for people so that they can say, oh, well, yeah, that actually does resonate with me. I'm, I am okay using the term vegan to refer to myself. So again, it's this, I'm just, as I get older, I think our lives are all about just how do we find that balance? What is the gray area? What are the gray areas? How do we live in the gray? Because the world is a gray place. It's not a black and white place. And so how, how do we do both? How do we hold on to that you know, use that word, make sure it means something in the world, embrace it. Don't, you know, don't shy away from it if it means something to you, but also be aware that it, it might not mean the same thing to other people. So how do we, how do we hold both of those? Yeah, because we don't want to be in an echo chamber. We don't want to be living in a place where everybody has the exact same definition. Oh, maybe sometimes we do. <laughs> sometimes it would be re relaxing for a little while, but we really want to live in a world where we learn from other people, not just have our own thoughts handed back to our, to us. That's right. Now, one of the things I heard about you recently talking about, and I try to encourage people who are feeling very, I know a lot of people who are newer to a vegan practice feel like I need to have all the answers. I need to have all the comebacks. I need to have all the, the list of, you know, uh, greenhouse gases and, and um, amount of water and land use. And, and I often encourage them to just chill and just do, do them. But advocacy in a restaurant, you talk about restaurant advocacy. I think that's a great place for people to start when they're not to just keep asking for what they want. I, w I wonder if you could talk about some things because uh, you, you and your, and your partners arrange travel and that's very much advocacy through travel, restaurants, and hotels. Yeah. You know, when I first did the first probably podcast episode on restaurants, eating in restaurants, even before it was about advocacy. And then, and then that chapter, you know, became a chapter in the 30 day vegan challenge, because that's a big one for people. I didn't call it eating out. I called it eating out and speaking up because that's what it's about. So much of this stuff about navigating being vegan in a non-vegan world is about embracing who we are and not being self-effacing and standing up for what we believe in and doing it in a joyful way. And you can do both. You can be very definitive and you can be joyful. I am that person. I am, I am, I do not mince words. <laughs> I am a very opinionated person and, uh, and I ask for what I want, but I do so in a way that is, you know, not off-putting, hopefully, hopefully that's my intention at least. So when we're talking about restaurants, so even before we're talking about advocacy, I mean, to kind of, to kind of jump off of how you asked it, everything we do is advocacy. However, how we respond to anything is advocacy because it's a reflection of the things we care about. So if we don't think people are paying attention all the time, even if we're not in the, you know, wearing the hat called advocacy, people are paying attention all the time. And when we communicate in any way in the world, that's a form of advocacy. So don't, don't, don't mistake that. And, and don't think people aren't paying attention when you don't have that hat on. Uh, we're always doing it to other people too. We're always paying attention. And if someone steps, you know, identifies a certain way, 
way, we're going to be looked at in a particular way and judged or mm-hmm. at least assessed, or assessed. So it's, so, so I'm always aware of that, but, but again, really, if you're going to a restaurant, the goal is to get something to eat that you really want, right? That's the main goal. Um, and for me, you're also in a scenario where you're connecting with another person. That for me is also the reason we actually are in the world. We're interacting, we're connecting. So one of the things I'm really proud of is that I know that people, you know, over the years when I've been talking about this, really struggle just saying like, hi, I'm vegan. Because they just know the response could be hostile, it could be defensive, all these things. But then what happens is they take on someone else's reaction and then aren't true to who they are and they become self-effacing, they become apologetic. So I'm sure you've done this. I'm sure you've heard this. I'm sure you can imagine the scenario in a restaurant where someone goes in and says, yeah, I'm fine. I don't, I'll just have, do you have a salad? I don't know. I'm just, I don't need anything. I'm, I'm okay. Or I know I'm such a pain. I'm the vegan. I'm, I'm, I don't want to be a pain. Can you just bring me, I don't know, just French fries, right? In this very self-effacing apologetic way versus, Hey, I'm vegan. I know you guys have some great things on your menu. Could you tell me if you could make this vegan for me? Or if not, what you think the kitchen can do? Like there's such a different orientation, even in the, your demeanor and the difference also not becomes not just like you getting what you want to get is actually the person, how they respond to you. Cause if someone's really self-effacing and apologetic, it kind of like the response is kind of like, Oh God. Oh, all right. Yes. What do you want? Right. So, but if we uh-huh. show up just like, Hey, this is who I am and this is what I'm looking for. And by the way, I'm giving you my money. <laughs> then here's what I want. And what can you do for me? People respond that way. So, so much of what I'm talking about, it's always been about how we, how we are not how anybody else uh-huh. responds. And I know uh-huh. there's a really popular orientation to the world, which is everybody's out to get me and everybody's against veganism and everybody gets defensive and everyone's really mean and everyone has stupid things to say. Okay. If that's what you think, then that's all you're going to see. I just don't share that at all. So, so that's just kind of one answer to your question. I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to go about it. And then, you know, if we want to go further than that, there's a lot to say about what we can encourage restaurants to do to actually increase vegan options on menus, but the irony, kind of back to our early conversation, is to discourage them from using the word vegan. (laughs) I'm so glad you brought this up because it's so funny. I posted the other day something, I went out to eat and I posted they had in the center of the the menu, they had the whole, it was an Italian restaurant in um, Palm Beach or West Palm Beach, Florida. They had a whole list and it was the vegan menu in the middle. And I posted it and I was delighted and I felt not so much seen, but relaxed. I meant, I meant like I wasn't going to have to have a conversation with a waiter and look at him and go, is he telling the chef exactly what I said? And I just felt like, okay, the chef knows about these dishes and I'm not going to have, I could just concentrate on having a nice conversation over dinner. And I swear it was 24 hours later, I, I heard you do a, a reel or a, a live talking about how you don't like that. <laughs> and it's of course so there's two sides, but I would love to hear you explain to my listeners the point of view that you had with that. Yeah. And and I totally get that. It is, we do so much of our lives are swimming upstream. You know, that's why the, the subtitle of the joyful vegan is, is staying vegan, really it's staying joyful vegan in a world that wants you to eat meat, dairy and eggs. It's in a non-vegan world. Like we're constantly swimming upstream and we do want to feel that we don't have to constantly, you know, struggle or ask or beg or whatever it is, or get, certainly get the, um, you know, the lesser of the options. And that, that's, big part of it. And that's a big part of why we do the trips that we do. So having said that, it's not to say that we still can't feel special and that there isn't a way to do exactly what you described on the behalf of the, the restaurants doing exactly what you described so that we can feel relaxed and we can feel seen and we can feel special and we can feel just like, oh God, I don't have to struggle. The difference is just, it's just, it's just, uh, it's a real, just a little shift in, in, in words, semantics. And so what were some of the things, Michelle, were they like burgers, pizza? No, no. There's beautiful pastas with beans pastas. And, and escarole. And um, there were some uh, lentil, lentil salads. It was very nice. It was, they were, they were nice. They were not, it was not like the, the, um, the sad things. Sure, sure. <laughs> no, <laughs> right. it was all like real ingredients, but prepared, you know, with no butter, no dairy, which many of the other pastas would have cheese and 
Sure. Um, <clears throat> and it was called, and it was in the center of the existence. It was in the center. It was in the fold. It's on my Instagram. I'll send you a copy of it. It was in the fold. And it was just a whole list of the vegan. The, so you knew what was vegan on the menu. And it said vegan menu. Did it, it say did. vegan options? And then did the, but the individual items, did they just say, uh, you know, arrabbiata, penne arrabbiata, and, uh, you know, spaghetti? Yes. Did they just say that? They didn't say vegan before each one. Not before, I don't think it said before each one, but it did have like basically the ingredients. So it had like a a pasta with um, orecchietti with, uh, you know, things. And then, and then it said what was with the orecchietti. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So there, so that's actually, that's actually not bad. So one of the things that I had said in that it was real that you're talking about, one of the things I said was number one, having a separate vegan menu is problematic because non-vegans are not going to ask for a vegan menu. And what that mm -hmm. means is, so if some vegans might be listening and say, well, too bad. They get everything else by default. Why shouldn't, <laughs> you know, why would they ask for a vegan menu? But the point is if we want them to eat plant foods and not animal products, and we know that the dishes are delicious over on the non-animal product menu, then we want them to order those things. We don't want to have a separate menu because they're not going to ask for it, right? Mm -hmm. So we want them to order those things. So it's a matter of not having a separate menu. That doesn't mean you can't have a section on the menu that says that that is separate. But, but what you're talking about is kind of somewhere in between. The thing is, you can still have all of those items incorporated throughout. Call them, like you said, the orecchiette, the arrabbiata penne, whatever, whatever. But just put a little symbol that says V. Mm. And then down below, I mean, this is every restaurant is doing this now. What's gluten-free? What's vegan? What's dairy-free? What's macro? I don't know, whatever. All yeah. the different things that people are keying. Um so just do that. But now the dish is completely normalized, right? It's not for the vegans because non-vegans see that too. So I would probably say to that restaurant, just take those items, incorporate them. If they're not already incorporated, keep them incorporated, get rid of the separate one, put V, make it very clear at the bottom what the V means. Just call them exactly what we just said. Don't call them vegan arabiata. Don't call them vegan pasta. Don't call them vegan orakia. They call them just what they are. Say it's a V. Now the vegans will often be incredulous because we're not used to seeing them incorporated in a menu, but we look for what is vegan. We mm. do look for it. And I know what you're saying too, because as you said, you know, sometimes it's nice not to have to look. We just want to have it easy because we often don't. So I get that. And it's kind of balancing what do I want for me at that moment? And what do I want for the kind of the larger cause? And we can have we can have both. So that's that's what I am talking about when I say having a separate vegan menu can be can be problematic. And then definitely calling the items vegan because again, they sound alien. They sound like they're just for vegans. It won't taste good. It's, that, that's not going to taste good. People already have their bias yeah. and um, and then they're not going to order it. And then the other thing you said, which I actually love, and it, it sounds like you've got experience with Italian. You've probably been to Italy. Um, one of the things that I love about Italy is that's exactly how a menu will look in Italy. You just have, you know, marinara, pizza marinara, and then the ingredients are below or a bruschetta and the ingredients are below. And mm. you know right away that they're plant-based because it doesn't say cheese. And the difference between somewhere like Italy and somewhere like the United States is they will bring you exactly what it says on the menu. They don't add cheese, which of course in the United States, we always have to say, I know I just ordered like a Japanese noodle dish, but could you please just make sure there's no dairy cheese on there as well? Because we're so used to this phenomenon of like cheese being thrown onto everything, right? But that the, having the ingredients listed, I actually love that because I think that that really highlights the the beautiful ingredients and people can see exactly what it's made with and what it means. So I love that idea. So it's just a little tweak in the situation that you're talking about. But I hear you very far off. Yeah, that's interesting. So you, you were actually talking about a completely different, like a separate binder with, with the, okay. I see. I see. I agree with you. I think, I, I think it is nice because I just always scan down and see, is there a, is there a gloss, what is a glossary? Is there a key mm -hmm. for the, uh, for the uh, items in it? Yeah. But even so I, when it's, when it's mainstreamed, <laughs> I always go and there's no cheese I know, and there's no milk. <laughs> I know. I know. We still have to, and we still will. 
We just yeah. will. We're going to do that anyway. I mean, yeah. I, I think even with the vegan menu, we'll still be like, really? It's vegan? Like, I think we just still do, right? So, and just to be clear, this isn't my opinion. It is my opinion I because I really am persuaded by the data. It's it's the, what the research is showing. It's what the research is showing. So this is based on surveys and data and research. That, and then I, and, and it already kind of matched my it was you know, opinion. So, but this, this really is what the data are showing. And, you know, again, like we can just say, no, I want it to feel special. And I just want to have my own menu and you can do that. It's just, do, you know, do, do you want to be right? Or do you want to be effective? Yeah. You know? Oh, I hear that. And I always, sometimes people say, well, sometimes do you just not get what you want? And I go, yeah, sometimes I don't get what I'm sure that everybody has gone to dinner somewhere and not gotten what they want. That's not just the the purview of of the vegans or vegetarians in the world. All of us have been disappointed in restaurants from now from now and again. But I do um I do always think every time we ask or every time we make a reservation and call and say so will there be some vegan menus for my people in my party and every time we do that I think that is what you've talked about as a restaurant advocacy. You're reminding business owners and chefs and service staff that people want that and they're coming. Yes. And the only way they're going to keep doing it is if the non-vegans buy it. They cannot make a living. Mm. They will not be able to sustain a business with just the vegans who come. If this is a non-vegan restaurant, that's what we're talking about, right? And there's a whole right. other conversation right. about vegans who don't even go to non-vegan restaurants. That's not what we're right. talking about. We're clearly talking about when you go to non-vegan restaurants. The only way it's 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 effective advocacy is if it's done in a way where the non-vegans actually buy it. Because yeah. we can have all of these, like, I want to feel special and I want to make sure they know that vegans are asking for it, but it's got to work. And this is what the data are showing is that here are some ways to make it work. Other things that you can, if you are working with restaurants, you being whoever's listening or you uh, or me, one of the other things you can encourage managers uh, to do at restaurants is if they really do want to give a shot to the items they have on the menu that's pl they're plant-based, then you train your staff. And you train your staff to say things like, because people, you know, will often ask, what's your recommendation? What's your favorite thing on the menu? And when, I mean, this is just basic human psychology. When a, a wait staff says something like, oh, something that's selling really well right now is the impossible burger or something that's selling really well right now is the smoky black bean burger. Or one of my favorite things on the menu is the smoky black bean burger. If you train your staff that way, that's one of the ways to increase, make people think that other people are doing something and they want to actually be part of it. Basic mm -hmm. human psychology, um, sense of belonging and same kind of principle when the, when the wait staff says something like, oh, my favorite thing is people will order it. So there are a lot of ways to, to, to you, so, you know, restaurants, you know, can add things on their menu, but they're going to take them off mm. if they're not selling. Yeah. Though I always think that in my family's case, I'm the only actual vegan. And so um, I think if a place doesn't have decent vegan options, all all of us, all 12 of us, if we're all together, we're not going there. <laughs> so, so they are, most people have a vegan family member or friend, well, maybe not most, but a good number of us have, have someone in that, in that, in that, uh, in that spot. But yeah, I think that's very interesting to talk about the, um, the training of the staff to support those choices that they have on the menu. That's yeah. just good management. That's just good restaurant, mm -hmm. you know, um, that's just good business. And so, yeah. and, 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 you know, to your point, there is something to be said for relationship building with these restaurants. You know, if you have a large enough restaurant, they're doing well enough with the non-vegan items, they'll have the items on because they know that's the trend. That's fine too. And then us making sure that we appreciate them. They know that we appreciate them, that, you know, we send a thank you note or what have you. Right. And we want to increase the number of people getting those menu items. We don't want to be the only ones ordering them. So there's a lot of potential there. So a lot of people who ask, you know, how do I get involved and what kind of advocacy, if that's something that's really appealing to you, that kind of advocacy, I think is sorely needed and, and can be really effective and measurable. So tell me a little bit about your travel work that you do, because I just heard you, um, the re a recent one you were talking about Alsace and um, you were talking about your African trips uh, last year. Yeah. Last year or 20? Well, yeah. Last year now because 2022. 20, yeah. 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 Fascinating. And I think so many people uh, don't know such a thing exists. So if you talk a little bit about your experience with that and what's going on for you in the in vegan travel. It's so exciting. exciting. 
It's so exciting. You know, my work has always been about making sure vegans don't feel that in any way that there is deprivation in choosing a compassionate, healthy lifestyle. We should not be second fiddle because we're not wanting to hurt anybody. We should not be second fiddle because we want to eat well and healthy. We should not get the lesser than but we do, of course, on the planes or in the restaurants, you know, et cetera. And you can go to any number of countries. I mean, we'll talk about group trips because these are group trips, right? It's because then, you know, what I also do is give people the language and the skills to be able to do this on their own. Because of course that's, you know, we're, we're always navigating in this world, whether we're traveling or just going to a restaurant or a family or a friend's house, et cetera. So of course I, I give people the, the skills and the language to be able to do that. But when we're talking about group travel, if you're going to go on a safari or you're going to go on a group trip somewhere, I can tell you right now, if it is not a vegan outfit, you are going to get the inferior everything. And you may be in a position where you're also confronted by some kind of animal exploitation, or they don't know what to feed you, or your, your food is just, you're going to have the vegan food. You're going to have the quote unquote vegan food. You're going to have the stuff that's just not as good. And everybody else is going to have the, you know, what they paid for. And so I started doing these back in 2015 with a, with a particular travel company and it was a vegan travel company. What was it? Was it company that was doing vegan travel trips and they uh it was in southern Italy and it wasn't the right fit for me the com the company that I did it with but two friends of mine or who had been followers and became vegan from the podcast and then became friends they came on the 2015 trip I did and the 2016 trip I did and while we were there we were developing a friendship a even closer friendship they started planting the seeds that we could do this together the four of us including my husband and I was a little skeptical because I forgot that these two people, Bridie and Seb are their names, Sebastian and Bridie, um, that they had actually had a history in tour leading, but they weren't doing that for a living at the time. And so the four of us started traveling around the world together. We've been to 18 countries together now. And um, and at every, every trip we would go on, Seb would say, we could do this as a CPG trip. My initials, we were, we, that's kind of our you know, kind of behind the scenes name for the trips. And we were calling them that initially. And I would say, no, that's not going to, how, what? And we'd go to Rwanda and we'd go to Botswana and we were in South Africa. And we were all around and they'd say, we could do this. And Seb finally said, let me put together a trip to Thailand for you. They were living in Bangkok at the time and he put it together and I sold it. And it sold very quickly. And it was an incredible trip. Seb is a master at what he does. And Bridie and Seb together uh, are masters. Bridie was working as an international school teacher in Bangkok at the time. And it wasn't a full-fledged business yet. And then um, it they we did a trip to Vietnam, a group trip. I sold that one. And, uh, and then we put together a trip to Rwanda. And it sold out in 48 hours. And um, it was by then that it was clear that Bridie and Seb needed to do this full time. And Bridie had been wanting to leave teaching and um, and Seb's business background is also besides tour leading, just logistics. And he's just so brilliant at all of the things that's required to put a trip together and run a trip. So um, so they started World Vegan Travel in uh, at the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, just when COVID hit, which was so <laughs> unfortunate. Um, but by then, you know, we've done about a dozen trips together and, and now things are picking back back up again. So, uh, you know, the trips are really special. Um, yes, you can go to vegan friendly places like Thailand and, and Vietnam. Um, when I say vegan friendly, I mean, obviously food related, but we go to places that I think are just a little more challenging, especially to get the kinds of quality consistently, uh, food that you're going to get like the French countryside, which is coming up in September of this year, 2023, we're in the Loire Valley and the Dordogne, which, you know, it's not, it's not a vegan friendly area. Once you kind of get to any rural area in any country, it's mm. just more difficult because in cities, you're just going to have a lot more options. And so our trips are revolved around making sure we spoil, you know, anybody who comes on our trips, so vegans feel like they are top notch and, and the food is phenomenal. We work with the restaurants and the chefs and the hoteliers and the people on the ground and all of the guides and whatever kind of trip we do. And so the food is fabulous, but of course we're celebrating the culture uh, that we're in as well and the countryside or the sites or what have you. And we always do something that's related to animal protection as well. Uh, so in Alsace, there is a bear and wolf sanctuary we go to. There's also a little farm animal sanctuary, a little micro uh, sanctuary we go to. In Tuscany, there's a farm animal sanctuary we go to. Same thing in Northern Italy. And then, of course, when you look at the African trips, they're really special because 
I mean, we are there for the wildlife mm -hmm. and um, Rwanda is just one of my favorite places on the planet. And, um, and seeing the mountain gorillas is just a really life-changing experience. And so is going to Botswana and, and having this experience. And it's also really meaningful because, you know, for me as an advocate, it's not only bringing the, the vegans and their friends and family, non-vegans are of course, welcome on these trips. We have a lot of single travelers. So people just feel really comfortable in the group travel experience. And, um, and it's, it's, it's really special to give this opportunity to vegans to have this luxury experience. Cause these are five-star our trips. We want people to, we want vegans to, to feel really special and not worry about anything and not be confronted by animal exploitation and have the best food and have the most delicious experience. Um, and for me as an advocate, it's really special to work with the vendors and to work with the, like, for instance, the guides in Botswana, you know, they're with us in the camps and they're eating the same food we're eating because we take over the camps. And so they have their own experience of like, this feels really good. And this tastes really good. And I know I should be not eating as much meat and I should stop and maybe I'll be vegan. And there's lots of wonderful encounters and experiences like that. So it's kind of just all around amazing. And we get to go to these wonderful places around the world. So it's pretty awesome. It's marvelous. And, and you are, you talked about advocacy is advocacy is anytime people see you. And basically when you go in a group, an individual vegan obviously can possibly make change lots of thoughts about things, but a group of them who are loving that being there, loving the culture, loving the people, loving getting to know the history and the, and all the things that are going on in different parts of the world are, are going to make even a more en masse kind of advocacy for the people around. Oh, Michelle, I mean, and you just said something that was, it was, it's so beautiful because there really is something really beautiful about just a group of compassionate people. And I'm really proud of my you know, my audience, they're just, they're just incredible people. And we hear from the hoteliers, from the managers again and again, this happened just in Rwanda and in Botswana again and again, that group is really special. Like we don't, I don't think we've had a group of people like this before. And these are world-class hotels and they see a lot of people and they see a lot of groups. They say that's the most loving, compassionate, kind group of people we've ever seen. And like, like, like that's so incredible for our travelers to hear because they are amazing people, but it's really seen and, and they are advocates. They are representing, you know, again, I try to, I try to, you know, help vegans not feel the pressure because I know that as soon as we walk in the room, there is the pressure that you're representing all, what all vegans are. So, you know, how do we walk that line? But there really is an aspect of it. And you are kind of representing what people's perspective of vegans are. And, and at least I can speak for the people who come on the trips. They're doing it very, very well. <laughs> That's marvelous. And I imagine it leaves a trace afterwards where the chef or different people go, Oh, you know, we should keep that on the menu that I did a great job with that. That's delicious. And people will like that. And there are more people coming. Absolutely. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And in fact, we've seen that. And we, and especially because these are trips that we do again and again, when we're in Alsace, for instance, now again, COVID, we had this interruption for a couple of years, but we're going back to the same boutique hotel in this little tiny town and in, 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 in Alsace in France little like Alsace for anybody who doesn't know Alsace it's in the eastern part of France it's on the border with Germany it was part of Germany it was part of France it was part of Germany now it's part of France very Germanic very north eastern rural and especially in the winter a lot of meat so this is not a vegan and this is not a place where people would say oh yeah that's going to be easy like going to Tuscany is incredible to me the best food in the world is Tuscan uh, cuisine and we don't have to we first of all we stay at a vegan villa we take over the villa but so we don't have to do any training when it comes to the chefs there because they're incredible. But we go to Alsace, you bet the 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 they go from zero to you know a hundred in learning about what we're bringing to them, and and we work with only the restaurants and the hotels who want to work with us, you know. So we already have an openness, which is be a beautiful thing to see. And so these are we've seen that the certain menu items stay on their menu once we leave, and that's another part of the advocacy as well. And I'm I'm working on some other things to just really in, instill that even more. Uh, when in some of the places that we go, because I really, I want to formalize it a bit more. And so I'm working on a project to actually formalize that a bit more with the places we go. Oh, marvelous. That's great.
That's great. Well, I hope you're not going to keep us waiting too long. I hope you'll announce it on your your podcast, <laughs> Food for Thought, not too long from now. Uh, what's coming up in terms of trips? Anything coming up that uh, people can still um, look into? Or yeah, or- for sure. We just well, so our uh, Italy trips are confirmed right now. They're in June, and when I say confirmed, it means we reached the minimum number uh, to run the trip and not lose money. <laughs> yeah. So it's, they're confirmed. Um, but Northern Italy just sold out, and Northern Italy is a wonderful trip. Um, we're up in the northern part of Italy, which I don't think a lot of Americans tend to go to. And we're in the Dolomites and the Italian Alps and, uh, and we go hiking and it's just really incredible. And we, and that's also not a very vegan friendly place because there's a lot of cheese and a lot of meat in that part of Italy. Um, But I will say for anybody who's interested in any of these trips to just go to joyfulvegantrips.com and get on the mailing list because people, you know, things happen and there are cancellations and, you know, there are openings and you never know. So just make sure that you get on the mailing list and, um, and voice you know, get on the list of whatever trip you're interested in or trips. So Tuscany has two spots left in in June, uh, 2023. So we have a couple spots left for that. And, you know, this is the time to book. If you're thinking of doing any kind of summer or fall travel, you know, everything's kind of crazy with the airlines now because of COVID. Now things are opening up, but the, you know, the airlines don't have all the staff that they had before COVID because they let people go. So you really want to get your your trips booked now. So yeah, so Italy in June, and then the French countryside has spots left. That trip is not confirmed yet. Once it's confirmed, then it's a hundred percent a go. But until it's confirmed, if you put your deposit down and the trip doesn't get confirmed, you get your deposit back. Once the trip is confirmed, you go on the trip, which is great. So mm-hmm. that's the French countryside. That's the Loire Valley in the Dordogne. We're going to the first European elephant sanctuary um, in the Dordogne in France, but it's in the Dordogne and it's quintessential French countryside. We're going to be on the Dordogne river. We're going to on the Loire, Loire River. We're going to be picnicking. We're going to be going to the sanctuary. We're going to Lascaux Caves, which is, you know, the 20,000 year old prehistoric cave um, art and animal drawings, which I'm super excited about. And we start in Paris and we end in Bordeaux. So that's going to be a really special trip. And then the Alsace trip is the one we've done a few times now. And that is Christmas in Alsace. And it really is kind of quintessential um, Christmas markets. And as I said, we've veganized all of the Alsatian dishes and we go to lots of little medieval, adorable you know, little villages. So, um, so those, so those trips are still on, but yeah, joyfulvegantrips.com is where people can find out. And then we've got other trips that are um, on, on board for, you know, 2024, we've had, Japan was closed for years. They didn't just open until recently. So we've got over 300 and some 50 people on the list for Japan because it was closed and people were like, I want to get on that list. So any trip that you're interested in, get on the wait list because there's lots of interest in these, in these trips. I, I remember a young a young vegan I know I had a terrible time in Japan about I don't know seven or eight years ago. Everything she ate, they'd said it was vegan. She would be like eating it, going, "It's delicious," but no, <laughs> it's not vegan. Fish, probably a lot of <laughs> yeah. fish. Yeah, yeah. So where would you where would where's your dream like that you haven't been able to figure it out yet, but you would love to put a trip together? Or is that is that proprietary? You don't even want to say. <laughs> I can say. <laughs> I mean, Japan for me is that I, okay. I've, I've been interested in Japanese culture and Japanese film and art and philosophy f- my whole life. And so uh, the fact that I haven't been there is, is a little surprising. It's just we've been going to other places and some of them more than once. So Japan really is that place for me. I can't wait. I can't wait for that to be put together. And there's other places around the world that I want to see and whether or not they become a joyful vegan trip or not is to be seen. But Scandinavia, I just really want to get to Denmark and, and Sweden and Norway and 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 other Nordic countries, Iceland and, and Finland. So kind of that region, the Nordic countries, um, definitely want to see in Croatia, which, which should be pretty, we'll make that happen. But I think the one that I've been really looking forward to and just really experiencing the things that I love about this cult country and culture and language and music and philosophy and aesthetics and everything is Japan. So I'm really excited about it. Now that sounds like a dream. And especially uh, some places are quite, I mean, depending on your, your, your level of comfort traveling and other languages and other cultures, some places are more accessible than others for, for Americans. I'm, I'm assuming for most English speakers. And I think Japan's some parts of, of Asia are probably a little more, uh, well, just a place you're thinking, will I be able to function? Will people understand me? Will I be able to communicate my needs there? So I think that I think that sounds like a great one to first experience with 
with your group. So uh, you have the your advanced team. Uh, <laughs> it's like the idea of having an advanced team. It is an advanced team. You know, Seb used to live in Japan. He lived in he's lived in uh, oh. mostly Southeast Asia, but he even lived in Japan for a short time. So he's got that advantage as well. Just he's he's just he just knows everywhere. But um, but to your point, you know, and and I'll just say this too because I I know that people hear group travel and get a little weird. Like you know, I don't know, it's not for me. We weren't into group travel before we started doing the trips. And my husband is an introvert and, you know, really values the time he spends alone and spends with me alone. He loves these trips. And I will say that like, there's magic that happens when you're going with a group of like-minded people and people are welcome to kind of stay by themselves a bit if they want to. And certainly there's downtime and certainly you, you can have your own room if you're a single traveler, you can share with somebody or not. It's really up to you how much you want to engage. But what winds up happening is that these beautiful friendships are formed. And, and that's really one of the magical things that happens on these trips. And, and so there are places that, again, you have an advantage when we went to Rwanda, there's the new Diane Fossey uh, mm-hmm. campus that Ellen DeGeneres and Portia uh, Durasi funded. And we do a behind the scenes tour. That's a thousand dollars a person. You're not going to do that if you're on your own, maybe, maybe not. But because we have 20 people, you know, that cost goes down and you're able to do things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do. But to your point, like, you know, if you're in Japan and you go to the countryside at all, you leave the cities, you're, you know, they don't speaking English outside of Tokyo. They're, they're just not. And, um, and, and that's fine. But the point is, you're going to kind of need to hire a car. You're going to need to have a translator. You're going to have to have a different experience than you would if you went to somewhere like Thailand, you know, where like it's, it's, a, it's a machine when it comes to their tourism there. Um, mm. And not that Japan's not set up for it, but they're not necessarily set up for English speaking travelers. And so the, the benefit of going with a group, especially to a place that feels a little more difficult in terms of language or in terms of making sure there's no animal products in the food, Japan would be one of those places. And there's other places um, I would say, but I think Japan is definitely, and France. I mean, I think these are a couple places that when you go with a group, when you go with us, um, little black belts around, you know, making sure that you have the best experience possible. Yeah. That's the time to think about group travel. I think that's a marvelous idea. I hope everybody everybody looks on joyfulvegan.com trips. I'm sure that's one of your lines, one of your pages. Um, what, um, I, also, you have cooking classes, you have videos, you have all kinds of, um, uh, you're a woman of many, many skills and talents. So mm-hmm. there's a lot on on the website. But um, if if there's a book, which book, I know you've, you've, you've written quite a few, is would Joyful Vegan be the first one you would recommend people uh, read? Is there a, a a recommendation you have of, of your books? It depends on where you're at. I mean, I think, so if 30 Day Vegan Challenge is still around um, and, you know, there's not that many copies left and I'm not sure it's going to be reprinted after it's after it's sold out, but I do really love that book and stand by it. And it's a really helpful guide for anybody, especially newbies transitioning. It's, it's also appropriate for non-newbies because it's talking about all the kinds of things we just talked about. Um, but I really, and, that, and there's recipes in there as well. If you want more recipes and videos, as you said, go to Joyful vegan.com you can join my live classes online but also there's all the on-demand classes so all the recipes and the videos from previous classes and they're and they're really fun and they're you know hands-on in your own kitchen and you follow along but I my dream is for every vegan to read the joyful vegan there's just so much in there that I think is just really vital for us to not only live as joyfully and sustainably as possible as vegans but also as advocates but also understanding why other people struggle and I think it's so important for us to know why people resist becoming vegan and why people go back to being, you know, to not being vegan. And um, I think it just makes us more compassionate to understand someone else's perspective and it makes us more joyful. So the joyful vegan, it's not a cookbook. It's um, it's on how to live joyfully <laughs> being vegan in a non-vegan world. And that's the book I really want. I, yeah, want I love that book. I think, I think it's got so much in it. It's not a one trick pony book. There's a lot in there. It's very accessible, but there's a lot in there. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Colleen, thank you so much. Colleen Patrick Goudreau, thank you very much. I really appreciate you making the time for us today. And, you know, I I work with a lot of people who are new to veganism and I have talked to a couple who are like, oh, I don't know Colleen's work. I'm like, what? (laughs) What? So I hope that you're going to get a lot more followers of of the new folks around because um, you've made it look easy for a long time and it's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's not. Thank you so much, Michelle. It was really a pleasure to be here. And and, and thank you so much. I look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank you, Colleen.
So, so what did you think of Colleen? You know, as I said in the introduction, I was more than a little timid about asking the joyful vegan herself, Colleen Patrick Goudreau, to be on Veg Your Best, because she's been in this space doing so much for years. But it was really important to me. It was really important to make sure that any of you, my listeners, who are maybe a little newer to veganism or to plant-based living, and maybe you're a little less immersed in all the veteran vegans who have done so much to create this way of life here, uh, it was really important to me that you get to know Colleen Patrick Goudreau and her work. Now, Colleen has a gorgeous website, Totally Jealous, which will introduce you to really the richness of her work. And there is a lot there. So I recocommend you you look her up. The uh, It's Colleen Patrick goudreau.com. Uh, I think you can find her just by Googling Joyful Vegan also. And all the links will be in the episode notes. I totally recommend you follow her on Instagram, subscribe to her email list. This way you'll get all her updates, all the info about these trips she's planning. And you can uh, follow along vicariously if you're not traveling to... Um, I think the Italy trip is already closed. So if you're not following uh, along in real life, you're going to enjoy her website and her emails. Uh, let's see. She's got cooking classes. She's got so much going on. So please follow her on Instagram. Follow her in her email, Colleen Patrick Goudreau. And not to mention, not to mention Colleen's podcast, Food for Thought. So I'm going to sign off with Colleen's line at the bottom of her emails. Love it. And it's so in keeping with what we try to do here at Veg Your Best. Colleen says, don't do nothing because you can't do everything. Do something, anything. Okay, kids, get out there. Get out there and veg your best. Veg Your Best podcast production, music, and editing by Charlie Weinshank. Thanks, Charlie. Before you go, it would mean so much to me and the Veg Your Best team if you would hit subscribe, leave us a five-star review, or share with someone you think might be interested. Something about algorithms, it helps bump us up a little in the rankings, and that's the best way to help others find the podcast and for us to find our audience. So until next week, make it easy and veg your best.